welcome to AICIS, dear friends. Today we have got a very eminent intellectual uh, to discuss important issues related to China. He is a professor of history at the Department of History at University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he generally probes the historical conditions uh, for the possibility of philosophy and politics in the modern world and in a a East Asia in particular. He's interested in the attempts of East Asian intellectuals to resist modernity to reviving postmodern philosophies and regions such as Buddhism. His first book, The Political Philosophy of Chang Taiyin, The Resistance of Consciousness, shows how in early 20th century, China, Chang Taiyin, drew on consciousness only, Buddhism to formulate a theory of revolution. In particular, the book explains how this seemingly ancient body of knowledge is reformulated as China was incorporated in the global capital system of nation states. Uh, his recent project, see, he tentatively entitled as Imagining Asia, Takeuchi, Yoshimi, and the conundrums of Asian modernity examines how philosophies of resistance intersect with visions of transnational identity and hopes for an alternative future. See, these are the uh, important uh, area of uh, Professor Giran uh, intellectual inquiry. And today we have got him, uh, see, in, at uh, AICIS to interact on issues. Uh, related to China and India and China. Uh, welcome, sir, to AICIS. Thank you very much. Um, glad to be here. And thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I think uh, we can start uh, our interaction, sir. See, uh, we can start with uh, uh, Buddhism. Yes. Uh, we want to know, see, uh, India and China. Uh, see, India is considered to be the birthplace of Buddhism, but uh, Buddhism is very powerful in China also. And India and China recently have been utilizing Buddhism as an important software tool uh, in their international and national, even national uh, politics. But uh, uh, if you look at the uh, utilization of Buddhism as a software, we see a two divergent uh, see, ways in utilizing Buddhism by India as well as China. Do you see uh, a, a, a different kind of narratives uh, uh, in utilizing Buddhism by China as well as India? Uh, yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, I'd like to respond to that question um, by thinking a little bit historically about the use of Buddhism, um, first in China, um, and, you know, maybe uh, touch on India as well. Uh, you mentioned a book that I wrote um, the, that came out in 2011 um, about Jiang Taiyan, the political philosophy of Jiang Taiyan, uh, the resistance of consciousness. And I think that book is important here because that deals with somebody in the 20th, early 20th century, a revolutionary, a Chinese, who um, really stressed um, Buddhism and um, thought that, okay, yeah, Buddhism, it comes from India, and he specifically was focusing on Yogacara Buddhism, um, and decided to really draw on Buddhism uh, through Chinese translations um, and use that to develop a kind of revolutionary theory, right? So. Uh, so in that sense, you could say, I mean, this is long before the days of soft power, but if you think about it, it is really a kind of theory of revolution, a kind of revolutionary morality, if you will, um, that he thought, you know, Buddhism was an, was an ideology that could be used for revolution. And what's interesting about that um, narrative from that time is that there are two things that first it sees buddhism as coming from india so there's no there's no debate there um and then 
it goes on to then say, ah, oh, yeah, but China can 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 appropriate it um, and and develop it in a, in in a in a different way for a revolutionary theory, right? Um, and uh, and and there are things that you know you can think about it in relation to, to Indian history in, in the sense that one of the things he likes about Buddhism is precisely the idea of equality. Now, in the Indian context, we know Ambedkar was drawn to Buddhism in some way also as a kind of resistance to caste and, and things like that, and to Hinduism as well, right? I mean, I think if we think about Buddhism in the Indian context, it always has to be thought of as in, in this kind of very tense relationship with, with Hinduism, right? In To the extent that you know, if you want to say, well, we want to use Buddhism in India as a soft power, it's always going to have to contest with with Hinduism, which has been much more the dominant uh, soft power uh, or ideological power, if we want to use that uh, that term. Now, in China, there is something similar because it's not like Buddhism exists in an, in a vacuum. Um, it exists in relation to Confucianism. And that's why the more some more recent uses, because you know Jiang Taiyan is talking much or much earlier. But I think if we think about more recent uses, they might stress the idea of syncretism, right? Which is san jiao he yi, right? So this idea of the three teachings as one, and that is Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. So once you do that, then all of a sudden, um, Buddhism becomes redefined in relation to these other other two kind of uh, teachings. And, and so the meaning becomes a little, a little different. So, so the question I think really is what kind of Buddhism we're talking about, right? Is it, is it a Buddhism that is going to be part of Confucianism, which is what happened in, already in the Sung dynasty, right? So the, in, the, after, in the 10th century around, you had Neo-Confucians who brought already Buddhism into the Confucian framework. And, and began to say, yeah, we can do Buddhist meditation practices while we keep the, the virtues of Confucianism, right? While I think the more radical side of Buddhism that sometimes Jiang Taiyan would really stress is where Buddhism goes against all of that, right? Uh, same thing you could say about Taoism, where it goes against all the hierarchies, right? Um, and so I think that that's where it could be a, 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 a kind of problem, right? That 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 what is the type of Buddhism that we look at, right? Then that's going to shape the narrative because there could be a, because in some sense, these narratives of soft power, sometimes, you know, I mean, you can think about them as narratives of the nation, but in both India and China, going straight back to Buddhism is going to be a bit of a problem, right? Because you're going to have to deal with the other, you've got, what, what about Confucianism? What about Hinduism? Um, and it's not the, how you narrate that history is going to be, is going to be tricky. Right, uh, you mentioned about uh, Confucianism. You know, the, when uh, say Mao came to power after the revolution, he was uh, yeah. trying to destroy Confucianism in the initial stages of uh, the revolution. But now we see uh, the communist government, especially under the leadership of Xi Jinping, see utilizing Confucianism as an important element uh, in their, say, uh, national as well as international politics. They are starting a lot of uh, Confucian institutes uh, all over the world, and uh, they are trying to promoting the, the basic ideas of Confucianism in, in national politics also. Uh, why they are going back to Buddhism and Confucianism to sustain their power uh, in China? So that's an interesting question, and and in some sense, again, I would like to go back to history on on this on this issue as well, um, because I have another. Um, uh, a recent book that just came out called, uh, I, I actually call it uh, The Politics of Time in China, in Japan and China, I think. And it's called, uh, and, I, and the subtitle is Back to the Future. Um, yes. and, and, and I think that uh, when we think about them going back to Confucianism, we have to always remember that this going back is also a going to the future. So they want, they think that, that they're actually doing something new. And, and, and the, the thing that makes Confucianism so interesting in the history of the Communist Party and, and even the history of the 20th and 21st centuries is that if you look at the beginning, the, the beginning of Chinese modernity was often um, thought of as a kind of uh, something that is backward, right? I mean, you have, you know, go against the 
House of Confucianism, Dada Kong, uh, you know, the, the Dada Kung Fu, that kind of kind of Kong Jia Dian, right? That kind of thing that you have to go against the Confucianists, right? And 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 that's the whole May Fourth Movement of 1919. And the, and the communists often picked that up, right? They picked that 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 idea up so that. Mao, you know, there, there's a big debate about how Confucianist Mao was. Some people say he was Confucianist in spite of himself, but usually explicitly, he's not very pro-Confucian. So it really is a, is a puzzle to us, right? Um, where Confucianism, why Confucianism makes a return, right? And, and I would say that Confucianism makes a return partly as a supplement to um, Marxism, and in some sense, to deal with the crisis of Marxism. And that is because, you know, as we move to the opening and reforms, right, 1978, then you get the, the 80s, 90s, right, 80s, you don't have as much Confucianism, but by the time you get to the 90s and 2000s, really, you get more and more of a Confucian revival, right? And, and that is part of this remaking the image of the Communist Party such that you know it can somehow rethink marxism as well right so that so that marxism um becomes in some sense much more, more harmonious with the tradition um and and this is uh in in some ways moving away from the maoist project i would think right where where it is much of much the emphasis is much more on class and class struggle and here what we're going to get is much more the idea of a kind of nation a national harmony um that that now marxism is also going to be interpreted in that way where where basically the state um representing the chinese community can resolve the problems of capitalism right so that is going to be the main actor and that's that is what's going to be really crucial here, right? And 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 that's why I think in this way Confucianism could be even more important ideologically than Buddhism for for um, for China, um, because Buddhism brings with it a, a lot of other issues, um, you know. But but it's also helpful because you have Buddhist communities in China, and it can become part of its you know China's whole. Idea. I mean, the whole Tibet problem um, is is connected to Buddhism, and so that's why that's one of the reasons why it has to somehow deal with Buddhism in order to deal with the the, the border problem. It has to incorporate it, right? And, and I think that's what's what's really crucial here. Uh, so, uh, yes, see, China is uh, uh, now when we come to the present uh, situation. Uh, China is promoting an idea like. Uh, uh, Asian century, uh, but uh, some say that uh, 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 in promoting Asian century, China is trying to be uh, a kind of hegemonic power in Asia. See, earlier it was thought that uh, see India and China together can make Asia see it's, it's an Asian century, but now we see a kind of uh, a hegemonic ambition from the part of China. See, by promoting this concept, uh, what is your take on that? So I think again this. Uh... Uh, Pan-Asianism is again one of my interests. I mean, I, I there's an, a book coming out on, in October. It's called uh, Pan-Asianism and, and um, the Legacy of the Chinese Revolution is what I think I called it. I think um, what was interesting is in your introduction you have the earlier. I you, I was when I started out writing the book, I thought it was going to be really about Takeuchi Yoshimi, who plays a very important role. Um, but in the end. Um, you know, it's 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 largely about Pan-Asianism in general in the 20th century, and I think that that you're right. But by the time you get to the 21st century, it looks okay. Asian century really means it's connected to to the rise of China, right? And and I think it's really important to think about the rise of China and the or, and the meaning of Pan-Asianism or Asia, um, and how it changes with the changes of China. So that if you think about Pan-Asianism and the, the figure that I wrote about, um, Takeuchi Yoshimi, uh, who was a Japanese um, sinologist who really promoted the idea of Asia and also promoted um, China in some way, that time, you know, in the 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s and 60s, it's largely about China as the Mao period, a revolutionary China that is going to resist um, the United States. and. 
um, is, is also going to unite the rest of Asia, right? So that it provides a role for Asia, a, a kind of a role model for Asia as, you know, both resisting Western imperialism and promoting an alternative form of development, right? So I think that, that I think, was the, was the key to that form of Pan-Asianism. So, so the question really becomes, okay, what's going to happen now in China, right? Uh, when we are in something like what some would call a post-revolutionary period, right? A period where, um, at the very least, China has, is much more incorporated into the global capitalist system. So the question then is going to be, well, is China just going to become another global hege hegemon, right? So is something like the Belt Road Initiative just a ideological veneer for uh, Chinese imperialism? So is Chinese imperialism going to replace American imperialism? In which case, when we, sh we don't need to be that excited about, right? And I think that that is the real question. Um, I think at this point, it's too early to tell. Um, I think um, there are possibilities um, that could go in, in different directions. And I think one of the reasons why I think it's too early to tell is because we we still live largely in a world of American imperialism. Um, and so that China at this point um, is, is resisting the United States uh, at some level. Um, and the, the only thing, of course, is unlike in the period of Takeuchi Yoshimi, where Mao really looked like he was creating another system that looks very different from what, at this point, it's not clear how different the Chinese system would be. I mean, would it be fundamentally different? And I think that's what it, for it to be appealing to us, um, it has to be fundamentally different. I think there are certain differences you could say, right? I mean, there are certain ways in which internally you know, there's a there's a there's a communist party. There's a concern for equality. You could argue there are all these kind of things. Um, but is it going to be fundamentally different? I think that we would need to we would need to see signs of that for us to really think of it as as a resistance that could be a completely different world. But I mean, we're so far from that. I mean, we look now at China, and we see that you know it's the way China looks. It's often well, American bases are all over the place, right? I mean, you've got South Korea, you've got this. So there's a sense in which China is coming out, out of it as, as, as on the defensive. Um, and at the same time, though, there is a kind of rhetoric that has changed, right? Because the rhetoric in the 60s was very much, okay, we are a revolutionary country and you know we're going to promote revolution in other places. Now, the argument is we are promoting a, a model for successful industrialization, right? That is based on the state and other countries like those in Africa and so on could follow us, right? So that, and, and that you wonder about that, how much is that like really connected to something like a project of socialism or something? I mean, that, that I think becomes the larger, uh, the larger issue for us. I mean, if we're interested in global kind of social transformation. Uh, see, in your answer, you mentioned about the Belt Road Initiative. And the China is uh, see, promoting that concept as an, a, a mammoth infrastructure project. Uh, see, uh, by utilizing the uh, uh, politics of time, uh, past experience, uh, can we call it as yeah. a Chinese tributary system? So that, you... that is a, yeah, so that's, that's a very interesting interesting question, right? I mean, and, and there are a number of people, uh, scholars in China who, who really promote the, the, the tributary system. Now, the thing with the tributary, the problem here really becomes how do we understand the tributary system, right? Um, because there would be those who would argue, well, the tributary system is an alternative form of international relations, right? Um, but the key with the tributary system was that it was a system of recognition, um, where where the, the countries in the, system, in the system accepted the Chinese authority um, as, as legitimate, right? And, and I think the best case for this is Korea and the Ming Dynasty, right? Korea and the Ming Dynasty is, the, is in some sense the model tributary state, right? Because it says, okay, we are going 
going to accept the Chinese values, we're going to become Confucian of our own will. We accept that. Now, what this means, of course, is China is no longer a place. China becomes more of an idea, right? Or an ideal. Because, because what happens to the Koreans once China, the Ming Dynasty falls and you get to the Qing Dynasty, right? right? Which is ruled by Manchus, right? A, a minority. The Koreans at that point say, no, no, we still follow the Ming Dynasty. So we are more Chinese than the Chinese, right? Or the people li living in China. So, so that is a sense in which the tribu tributary system becomes that kind of ideal. Now, the key is, and this gets us way back to the soft power problem, because the tributary system in that sense is soft power before, you know, avant, avant la lettre, right? So it is, it, it is soft power in the sense that you don't, you don't use force, right? It is really this idea of recognition. So I think from that perspective, I think China would be very happy to be a tributary system. But, but it's not that easy, right? I mean, because it is going to have to get the recognition of all its neighbors. But who are these neighbors, right? I mean, think about even in East Asia. Korea now is not Korea of the Ming Dynasty. Um, in fact, South Korea is extremely close to the United States. North Korea, you know, there might be some potential there, but it's it's not in a very good situation. Then the other is Japan. Now, Japan, there was a period, like if you go to the Tokugawa period, Japan, there was a lot of Confucianism there. And so then again, there was some kind of soft power. But now, what is Japan's closest ally? I mean, it's, it's the United States again, right? In fact, some people would say, um, if anything, you know, Japan is is being neo is a neo colonial sa satellite state of the United States, right? Or or if the tributary, it's going the other way. It's the United States rather than China. And so so China has a lot of trouble um, to do this. It, it faces an uphill battle, um, and and it's it has to somehow the the hope, of course, I mean, is that there will be uh, more of a delinking, right? From if, from from the United States, but how do we see that, right? I think that's going to be the the, the problem, right? How are, how is that going to happen? I mean, and that you know, this is where maybe when we get to more and more of global crises, we could get some something is going to change or something like that. I mean, this is where it's hard to predict what's going to happen. When come to China's neighbors, you know, if you look at the China's uh, uh, disputes with uh, its neighbors uh, and uh, 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 the South China Sea dispute. Uh, it's a dispute in South Asia. See, in all these claims, they say that uh, the, the areas they are claimed are their own historically. Right. Yeah. See, yeah. Uh, this is a, a creating a lot of problem in, in, in East Asia as well as in South Asia. Uh, see, this is a kind of approach uh some say that it is a new one or, or some say that it is rooted in his, his history see how do you look at uh, these issues historical dispute border disputes and uh, see in, in south in south china sea uh, they are claiming that it is uh, based on the nine dash line right no no other country is accepting that nine dash line right in india china relation also they say that uh, see this entire part of uh, uh, arunachal pradesh is their own so, uh, uh, then uh, the Axai chain is their own, but they don't have a kind of uh, historical uh, document uh, to claim that. See, this is, uh, they are claiming and uh, at the same time they are trying to assert their sovereignty over this part of uh, this uh, geographical region. How do you look at uh, these kinds of uh, disputes? So I think the first thing to say is if we look at it historically, um, I think that these disputes, I would say, are new. I don't think that they are, they are something that, that, that are there, you know, in China historically. In fact, I doubt that they're there in most places historically, right? Because the boundaries of the pre-modern empires are much softer than the boundaries of the nation state. So the fundamental um, root cause of these kind of um, issues are is largely the trend transition from empire to nation state, where all of a sudden boundaries become much harder uh, and, and boundaries become um, 
more 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 important right i think that that i think is 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 going to be the is going to be the real the real issue right um because i think that what happens here i think that and and i don't think we can connect all the problems to this but i think uh, to a significant degree um we have a lot of the lines that are drawn uh, between a lot of these regions are, are largely due to foreign powers, right? The, the legacies of colonialism. Now, in the Chinese case, it's complicated because the China, when, when China became, you know, turned from the Qing dynasty to the Republic, one of the things it wanted to do was keep the boundaries of the Qing dynasty, right? So that I think is the, and the Qing dynasty was fairly large. And so that's, that, that of course is, is is something that 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 caused problems both both internally and externally. But I think that we should remember, uh, we should keep in mind here. Um, I think the difference between soft boundaries and 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 harder boundaries, and that we live in a in an age of harder boundaries. And I think that a lot of the prob these problems um, really emerge when the boundaries themselves become politicized. Right? That that we think about. I think one of the things we have to look at is when did these problems occur, right? Because the boundaries were boundaries at all, at a, for a long time. And then, then suddenly the 60s, you get the, the tension between, between China and India, for example, right? And then we have to ask, why did it emerge then and not, and not earlier, right? And I think that's one of the questions that, that I think we, we, we have to ask, right? And perhaps also something about the forces um, behind some of this, right? I think, I think that would be the other, that would be the other question, um, but but you know I'm I'm on on this question I'm definitely not an expert so I'm eager to hear your your thoughts on this as well. See, uh, we have another question with regard to uh, its uh, roots of history. How rooted in history are China's security concerns? Does it have something to do with current geopolitical considerations or ideas of China's primacy as a nation? I think for sure uh, there, I think it's connected to the, an, an earlier question um, that, to which I responded. And that would be this whole problem of um, how China sees itself in the world, right? It sees from the Mao period, it saw itself as surrounded, right? Because initially it had China it's, as the Soviet Union as, as an ally. Afterwards, that also became, uh, became more hostile. So it felt itself surrounded. And then I think that now, now, in today's world, what's happening? Again, I, we, we can talk about the military bases around China, right? That's something that Chinese often mention. Um, and that's connected to the Taiwan issue as well. But, you know, South Korea, Japan, none of these are friendly neighbors because they're all connected to the United States. Now, the other issue, of course, things are getting more complicated as we speak because we're now living in an age where there's a war going on in, in, in Ukraine and Russia, right? Or, right? And so, so, so there, uh, again, China-Russia relationships have, have, been, have been, you know, in some sense rekindled and that we are beginning to get, uh, and this is where, again, China-India seem closer, right? Because when in the United States, when I was talking to people, most people initially assumed Oh yeah, Modi is going to support the United States, but then all of us, you know, because of it, the connections with Russia, he he goes slightly the other way. He's not; he's at least tries to remain neutral. Is not going to be uh, doing quite what the United States wants. So there, I think here we get another kind of a, a geopolitical situation that is emerging, um, where uh, we get slowly more resistance to the United States and 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 from the people on the global south, right? So it's it's you know a lot of the the African nations. We begin to see, wait a second, you know, maybe NATO isn't all that it's cut out to be, you know, and that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, situation, right? So I think that that's where we really have to think about China's um, security concerns as very much connected to the geo geopolitics that's constantly changing and also the global system, right, where, where you have still the problem of American dominance, where one might argue that American soft powder, power is, is weaning. And so, but then it's overt military power is going to become more and more evident, right? We can come to the uh, internal political uh, uh, hierarchical system of Communist Party and uh, it's, it's a, a relation to history. To what extent 
the Chinese Communist Party an extension of the leadership principles rooted in history? And has it grafted Marxism Leninism into the political system? How rooted in history is the appeal of Marxism Leninism and the centralism that's, that goes with it? Or is it something else altogether? Okay, so this I think is is in some 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 sense another way of asking um, the Marxism Leninism and tradition question, right? Because you, if you think about from the 1980s or even even yes, at least that early, there was always the question: Well, are Mao and Deng Xiaoping, and now we could maybe say Xi Jinping, are they just emperors, right? Are, are they are they is that really what's going on? And so then it's not really. Um, it's not really like uh, Marxism, Leninism, or, or something like that, or you know, and and there I think there is an there are some important differences. So because the first thing is that usually when um, when we talk about um, Mao and Deng Xiaoping or Xi Jinping being like an emperor, we usually have the image of the Chinese emperor as being someone who's an autocrat with complete power. But we have to realize that the Chinese emperor never had a state uh, um, like the modern state that was able to penetrate so completely into the localities, right? That I think is something that emerges uh, much later, right? I think really, uh, really with Mao, right? With Mao, you get a state that has the capabilities of of doing a lot more, right? Of doing a lot more, of having much more a different type type of governmentality, right? Of, uh, of being able to monitor the citizens at at a, at a much greater level, and that I would say for better or for worse, right? Because if you think about the redistributive policies of of the of the Chinese government, right, which is often what Marxism now becomes, right? Marxism now, if we think about what Marxism is, it's an often thought of as solving the poverty problem in the in 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 China so that's the so-called you know fupin right poverty um, alleviation plan now that is not would not be possible with a, something like an imperial state it would be harder even though the idea is there right if you go all the way back to the mencius right he mencius i think in in one of the early um, uh, sections he talks about uh, poverty Right. He talks about, um, you know, if you have a situation, you know, where there are people starving in the street and you say, hey, wait a second, this has nothing. The ruler says, hey, this has nothing to do with me. It is just the problem of the harvest. He says that is no different from taking a knife and stabbing somebody and saying, hey, that wasn't me. It was just a knife. Right. So he says that the ruler then has the obligation to redistribute, right? So that, that you can say is continuing. But what the Chinese government can now do that previous governments cannot do is really make that redistribution happen, right? Um, it, it is able to, to, to do more of that. So that is the double-edged sword, right? Because on the one hand, it, it means that it can control much more, right? It, it, can, it can monitor, it can, you know, and that, and that is where, uh, you know, when that is left unchecked, obviously there can be problems. But on the other hand, when it comes to something like poverty alleviation, it has the capacity to be able to redistribute. Um, and, and this is where, but, but of course, now, is that Marxism-Leninism? Well, that's another question, right? I mean, if you think about Marxism, the project was to overcome capitalism. Now, if you think about this problem of redistribu dis redistribution, well, that is something that you can see in a welfare state as well, right? So that, so that we have to see, um, we have to be careful. And I guess the question is, is not saying, oh, we shouldn't redistribute because now the immediate situation requires redistribution. But the question is really, where is this going? What is the goal in the, in the long run, right? What is the larger goal is there is there a sense of you know transforming the world into a different type of system or is it a system where i mean because if you think about the poverty that emerges in china well it's very much connected to the economic reforms that happened in the 90s and so on right where, where you began to have what is called you know uh xiagang where you lay off the workers right and then all of a sudden you know with 
um, Jiang Zemin and so on, you have more and more incorporation into the neoliberals kind of system. And then I think what what happens afterwards with with Xi and others is is the attempt that uh, well we we have to stop this somehow, right? We have to now have more control over this. And so then this is a kind of strange return at some level to 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 Marxist uh, ideology, at least at the level of, of discourse. And yet, it's not a complete pulling away from the 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 actual globalization, neoliberalism, and so on, right? And so, so, so this is where you know China is a very complex place right now. Right now, it's got all of these contradictory forces that are that are battling it out. Right? Uh, if we look at the history of Chinese Communist Party, uh, we can see the sudden dismissal and disappearance of uh, so many leaders. See how rooted is rooted in history are the purges of the powerful in China. Well, here I mean there is a, this again is is not a subject that I'm an expert on, but I think there is a you know there's one example that immediately comes to um, mind, and that is Hai Rui, right? Because Hai Rui, you know, who was dismissed from office, uh, you know, there's that famous play. I think it's maybe the Ming Dynasty. And that was one of the things that started out the whole cultural revolution, right? I mean, the the cultural revolution was a big debate about that 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 play. I mean, where where you have um, you know someone like Peng Dehuai, right, who 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 made a criticism of Mao, and then he is he is uh, you know dismissed in some way, and 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 then I think there's a big question of is this just history repeating itself, right? Is this the same thing? And, and um, you know, I my own take on this is um, there's there are probably still some differences because and I think that we really should put uh, China in a in a larger uh, global context that when we make these these when we ask these questions about you know state purges and so on um, I think one of the questions we should ask is well how different is it from other states right do we have such purges in other states. Do we have purges, you know, in 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 various? And first, we could ask, you know, communist states, uh, but but even non-communist states. So so then, you know, we really think about China um, not only in relation to the past, because if we think about it as a past, then then what we are assuming then is that someone like Xi Jinping is really an emperor, right? And then the other people are all and and that doesn't seem to be quite that make quite sense because the the whole structure of the bureaucracy in in china today is very different from an imperial structure and and and, and that's one of the reasons that that we're getting a lot of these a, a lot of these issues right and i think that a lot of these purges might be connected to, to kind of political projects and i think that was the case even in the mao period right because if you think about Cultural revolution, we could say, okay, there was a purge of Liu Xiaoqi and, and, and Deng Xiaoping, right? But what was the reason behind it? Well, he thought that they were taking the capitalist road. Now, I think there could be something similar uh, in some of the purges. Uh, yeah, right. And here, I think each purge we'd have to take in, in, um, in, in, in sort of isolation and sort of try to think, of, or rather in its context, right, as an individual case. Because and and this is difficult because we often don't know that much about these purges until much later, right? Because we hear we hear about something, and in China, people may not even have heard about these. We might know something about it, but you try to find more information, and you don't get that much information about 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 the purge, right? Um, usually, use sometimes they connect it to corruption. Sometimes they connect it to you know some kind of suspicion of somebody being a spy. There's that. But there could also be the idea that they're taking a different line, and 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 that is, and and because that was, I think, what was happening in the Cultural Revolution, and then that became a whole kind of a struggle, right, uh, between two factions in 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 the in the Communist Party. So, but I think that the short story then could also be that, you know, the Communist Party in China is less of a monolithic entity than we think it is, right? That the fact that there are these other kind of voices that are coming up that sometime needs to, need to be excluded um perhaps tells you that th there are more voices in the communist party than than we can know from looking at it in the on from the outside we're also interested to know uh, how they are 
addressing their economic problems uh, in a historic uh, by utilizing the historical experiences how has the chinese leadership historically dealt with economic downturns and to what extent are the reactions of the present chinese leadership consistent with or divergent from past experiences yeah so i think here again i would i would go back to the problem of confucianism and 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 you sort of um serving the people um because there is um uh, very much you know during the in the when there was a kind of revival of confucianism in the 90s one of the big issues was the problem of confucianism and democracy and if you look at the the term for um democracy in china right um uh, today it's minju right but the two characters right min and ju existed much earlier but but what it actually meant was the ruler of the people right rather than the rule by the people right so if you can't find the concept of of democracy directly in confucianism but what you can find is the idea of minban or people as the root and so what that means is that when you in times of economic crisis again the state has an obligation to help to provide for the people right that i think is a very old chinese concept um and so that that i think is something that we can see in as 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 a kind of continuity right because if you just say hey i didn't know what to do it's as a crisis people are going to starve we don't know it's not my pro i mean that's not an attitude that the that that the state can take even though at one point you know when the state was moving in the 90s from you know a more state centered system to a market system they were laying people off and at that point they said hey it's not me it's the market right um they had to say no you're you lost your job that's not i can't do anything about it that's now we're not doing you know when state owned enterprises can't compete we have to start letting some people go right now that point was a was a period where there was a tension because from two perspectives from the communist perspective where the worker is used to saying hey well i'm supposed to be guaranteed a livelihood they should they should be provided for and then from the confucian perspective where the ruler is supposed to provide but even from that perspective from both perspectives that position was very difficult to sustain and what we see now is a move beyond right and this is going to be something that is going to be a very contemporary issue because we see that chinese china's growth levels are not 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 what they used to be now that means that there could be a crisis and then the state is going to come in but that the state i think for for china is as i said it's a double edged sword it is something that you know is both could be extremely beneficial for china but it it but the black, the flip side of that is the governmentality the 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 possible control right that it it really knows what's going on right it it can monitor internet and so on and i think that that's really going to be the question is you know what happens now because if you think about what there are certain historical uh events recently um and you know even say in the from the 90s right because you think about 1997 you had the big asian asian financial crisis um but there notice that china was not as affected by that and that's largely i think because of the state 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 regulations right that the state was able to control capitalism in a way that 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 other places weren't now we could ask the same question about whether it's going to be able to continue to do that right and that's that's really a question of you know how strong how capable is the state of being able to weather the forces of of global capitalism as it's now playing the game in, in more and more uh ways final question to you sir uh, that is something related with again india and china see these two countries are known as civilizational states and uh, we have a history of uh, friendship of around uh, more than 2000 years but still see after the, the independence and the revolution in china see especially after the 1960s the relationship see if you look at the bilateral relationship it is not at all good and it is a kind of rocky rela relationship and uh, yes. see as these two nations are two civilization states and they had a, a very friendly relation history of friendly relationship uh, uh, see 
can these two nations improve their relations? Well, my, my quick answer is I certainly hope so. Um, um, because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a question that um, I've thought about um, for a while and many people have asked me. Um, and I think that it is, it is quite unfortunate um, that the relationship is, is not as good as it could be. Um, and I think that the problem is perhaps on the one side, uh, a lack of understanding on both sides. Um, we have to understand that um, for a long time, um, so the study of India in China was extremely neglected. Um, was, uh, if you think about it, when I was first going to China, you know, in the 90s, there was, I think, barely, maybe, maybe there was like in Beijing University, the biggest, maybe there was like a Hindi program or something like that. Um, and, and when people talked about India, or even if I were saying that, you know, I originally came from India, they, they would say, well, oh, Buddhism or something like that. You know, that, that that's about, that, that, that was the extent of their knowledge and uh, maybe extreme poverty. Maybe that's the, the other thing that they, they, they think about. And that's partly because of the media representation and so on at the, and in the, from the 70s and, and, so, and so on. But on, on, the, on the bright side of this, that is changing. Right. There is now, um, you know, like Beijing Language Institute has, you know, definitely Tamil. They were interested um, in, uh, in fact, in, they even invited me to talk about like maybe even something like, you know, Kanda literature and things like that, even though, you know, I'm not an expert on that at all. But part of the problem is that, you know, they're only starting. Right. Uh, and so they're trying to get what they can, trying to get some more information trying to get a sense of, you know, first of all, the diversity of India, right? I mean, that you can't just think about India as, 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 as one thing um, and, and, and just be done with it, right? So I think that, that, I think, at the very basic level, and I think the same is happening in India, right? Um, you know, um, I come to, to India and um, when, I, when I talk about China, it's, it's more recently that people are getting more interested in other things other than like business, right? Because when I talk to my friends, you know, I went to high school here and I would often talk to friends and say, oh, you do China. Well, can you tell me about the business situation there, right? When that's not really my, uh, my, my area. But I think that now slowly there is um, beginning to be a broader interest in China. I think that that's going to be very important in the long term for improving uh, relationships between the two countries. I think more people uh, on both sides studying the language in, in the case of, of China and in, in the case of India, Chinese people studying the languages. I think that's going, to, that's going to be the beginning, right? But then there is, of course, the political problem. And that problem um, is, again, unfortunate because I think that unlike in the Japanese case, where the tension is much more serious, Right, the tension is much more serious because the war memory is much more at the forefront. Um, I think that the Sino, the Sino-Indian War, is is not as serious, and it's something that should be able to be overcome by both sides. And I think that, um, and I think that another part of this is going to is is of course the present. Um, uh, Indian government's relationship with the United States. I think that that makes things much more complicated, right? I think that where where that itself can cause um, a certain distorted view of China based on also media, right? Because we we know that the American media um, is is quite good at misrepresenting China, right? And I think that as uh, of you know, and it's not to say that China doesn't have problems. But there is almost a kind of Cold War mentality in, 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 in the U.S. media that just sees it as, as all negative and, and, and as sort of irrational, even, right? Or as just being a hegemon, right? I mean, um, and, and, and I think that it's very important for India-China relations that India does not just repeat that vision. And, and that it has it begins to have its own autonomous uh, vision of China uh, as, as, as a potential ally, right? 
And that's going to require rethinking its relation to the United States, right? So that, so that you know, there was really a moment, I mean, because if we think about before um, the, the Sino-Indian War, relations were quite good between China and, and, and India. And I think so that's why that, that period, I mean, the Nehruvian period is really one where we really have to think about that. So, so then you could say, okay, then there were some mistakes that, that, that were made. Um, you know, and you could say, you know, it had to do with maybe China wanting to be the leader of the third world. I mean, they're, they're all kinds. I don't, that's a complex issue. But, but the thing is, that issue um, should not uh, blind us to the importance of um, Sino-Indian ties today, right? Because that really is a potential. It's really a potential to resist um, American hegemony. Uh, all kinds of things open up if if that relation can be uh, can be stabilized and and actually improved and and I think that it's not completely unimaginable because um, given the way in which you know things are beginning to turn in with respect to you know India Russia relations I mean that itself could cause cause some openings but I think you know um, it's 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 still a long road ahead but. I'm more optimistic about that than the China-Japan relationship, which I think is also important. But especially since they, they, you know, they're close, and but um, but but there I see much more problems because in addition to the American problem, um, you have the 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 war problem and 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 the war memory issue and all of those because the, and and because you have nothing like you know the Nanjing massacre in that that really is like a thorn in that in that relationship while in 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 the sino-indian uh, relationship right i think so i think so that i think yeah i think that uh, you know the 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 long the short the short answer is really i guess um you know more work uh, both diplom diplomatically and also in terms of um educating the the people on both sides so thank you sir see you have uh, see spent uh, your precious time with us uh to share uh, some important uh, views because uh, uh, we are proud that uh, we have got a very uh, prominent uh, intellectual who is looking at the historical aspect uh, we call it uh, the politics of time uh, in china and japan thank you right uh, <laughs> uh, see uh, on behalf of aicis uh, i express our gratitude to sir